people on the list for any type of organ is uh, 116,000. Most of them are waiting for kidney transplant, so 90,000 um, people um, are waiting for kidney. And only, um, only 26,000 of transplants performed um, per year on average. Um, what about our transplant program? So our transplant program is um, average size. Um, we have um, 238 patients uh, currently that are active on the transplant list. It's about 70% of all the, um, all the people on the list, so 30% are inactive for, for some medical reasons. And um, we're really happy um, to tell that we have already transplanted 82 kidneys this year, and um, that's exactly the number that we trans uh, that's actually more than we transplanted last year already, and we still have one and a half months to go. So I think we're going to do pretty good, and we're going to beat the cat. Um, so there's a lot of people on the transplant list. Not a lot of people are getting transplants every year. Um, so obviously, um, the time from getting on the list to the time when you get the transplant is pretty long. Um, this is uh, the most recent USRDS report. Um, they're not doing a very good job of keeping up with it. Um, with it. But as you can see, in 2010, the um, average wait time was about four, four and a half years. Actually, right now, the average wait time for a disease or a kidney is five years. It varies a lot. Um, uh, I tell people that you're lucky you live in Kentucky. Um, uh, we have shorter wait times than um, centers on East Coast or West Coast. In California, it can be seven or even 10 years sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> So, um, and obviously, if people who were listed first time, the wait time is a little bit shorter. For relisted patients, it's a little bit higher. Uh, these people are more sensitized. It's, hard, it's harder to get the kidney that matches them. So, um, how, um, how do our wait times look? Um, so, in Louisville, um, our wait time, average wait time, is 30 months. Uh, University of Kentucky in Lexington is 39. Um, St. Vincent Hospital in Indiana, 38, and Vanderbilt is 57. So when we go for outreach and, and talk to the referring physicians, we always show this. <clears throat> now, um, again, as I said, uh, we're doing more transplants and we're listing more people. Um, our um, referrals have over last year increased by about 20%. And um, our wait list um, increased also um, about the same. And as you can see, um, we have already transplanted 82 um, kidneys. Um, over the last 10 years, our record was 99 kidneys. Um, we'll see if we reach that uh, this year. Um, we're trying to do a little bit better with living donors. Um, we have transplanted about 14, uh, not about 14 this year, and the maximum was 18. Um, trying to grow that, do, and I'll talk about uh, what we do to increase the living donation. Um, we're doing very well with kidney pancreas transplant. So combined kidney and pancreas transplant, um, we've done 12 already this year. <clears throat> and um, liver kidney transplant, four. Um, and I didn't put that on the slide, uh, but we've done um, over the last year one combined heart and kidney transplant, which we haven't done for ages. And he's still alive. <clears throat> So um, we definitely want to transplant a, a lot of patients, but um, another very important thing is um, the outcomes. Um, uh, you don't want the only quantity, you want quality too. So um, we, can, we can tell that our outcomes are, are actually also very good. Um, um, so SRTR is the um, uh, Scientific Registry for Transplant Research is the biggest database for all the transplant centers in the United States. Everybody has to report their outcomes um, to SRTR, and they come out with a report every year that shows um, how each transplant program does and what the trends are. It's uh, publicly um, available. Everybody can look it up. Uh, so. Um, um, your competitors, your patients, your referring physicians can look it up and, and see how you're doing. So you can't hide much. Um, so we're doing actually very well so far. Um, the the um, period of time when they looked into these outcomes is from January 2014 to June 2016. And um, 
what the transplant programs are um, 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 followed for is mainly one year graft survival, so um, one year kidney transplant survival, and one year um, patient survival. Uh, so um, our observed outcome for one year patient survival was 97.5%. And the expected outcome, an expected outcome is basically for similar size, similar program, is 96%. Um, ours looks better. It's not statistically significant, but we don't have to tell that everybody. So um, we're doing pretty good on that. And the hazard ratio, so if it's less than one, then it means we're doing better than expected. If it's more than one, we're doing worse than expected. So you're, we're doing pretty good with patient survival. And uh, we're doing pretty good as well with graft survival. So graft, one year graft survival is 95.6% and expected is 94.6 and hazard ratio is less than one. Um, so this is for disease kidney donor transplants. Um, um, how are we doing with living donor transplants? So here we're doing pretty good too. So um, patient survival one year was 100% uh, for this uh, for the period from uh, January <coughs> 2014 to June uh, 2016. So I don't think we, we can expect better and, and as well as um, grass survival. <coughs> so um, as I said, one of, uh, one of our um, goals is, uh, in transplant program is to use um, uh, every potential kidney, not to waste any kidneys, to uh, put uh, right kidney into the right patient and to get m out most of the each, each um, do uh, kidney. So um, how do we do that? Um, so actually there's uh, national policies that help us uh, with it and we have some center specific efforts um, to improve that. Um, so national policies, um, uh, there was a new organ allocation system implemented in 2014 and I think it benefited a lot of um, um, people on the transplant list, and I'm going to go over that um, uh, briefly. And our center-specific efforts, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit uh, uh, more detail, is uh, we're trying to accept uh, more lower-quality kidneys for right for, for right people on the list. Uh, we are, are really trying to uh, involve in uh, paired living kidney donation. Uh, uh, we are also accepting increased CBC infectious risk um, uh, kidneys from um, deceased donors that are at risk of um, transmitting some inf infectious disease, but I'll talk about that later. It sounds horrible, but it's not. Um, and then we also have one fun program. Um, it, we call it a living donor champion program, um, and I'll introduce that too. Uh, so. Um, to make it a little bit less boring, um, at least I always like when there's some patients in the in the presentation. So we'll start with patient number one, and all my patients are real patients and um, uh, not made up. Um, so this this gentleman is 78 years old, uh, white male with a history of diabetes and hypertension, um, who got um, had a very kidney transplant in March 2013. Um, it was a great transplant, zero antigen mismatch. Um, it was from a standard criteria donor. We don't use that um, term anymore, but we used to use it in 2013. So it was from a 12-year-old donor who died of the um, 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 ac uh, motor vehicle accident, an eventful post-transplant course. Um, uh, so he did very well during the surgery and after surgery. So four years forward, I saw him in October. Uh, his creatinine is 0 0.8. He has no proteinuria, never had rejection. His main complaint is he has less energy and he can't play golf as much. Um, so um, there were some glitches in his, uh, um, in his um, course. He was prescribed testosterone for higher energy and, and developed um, erythrocytosis and atrial fibrillation, but now it's all resolved. So is there anything wrong with this picture? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, looking from the perspective of a patient uh, is great. He got a great kidney. The kidney is going to last as long as he lives. He's going to die with creatinine of 0 0.8. Uh, but if you look from a more global perspective, uh, we could have used this kidney to a recipient who is 18 years old, who had FSGS, for example, and it could have lasted 30 years. 
So basically, we're going to waste 20 years on this kidney. So um, national, uh, the national policy of allocating kidneys addressed this program, uh, this problem, big time. Uh, these few slides um, are just going to illustrate um, that this is a real problem, not in only my one patient. So <clears throat> this slide shows that we're doing a better job in um, it, it expanding the life of the transplanted kidneys. So kidney fails from rejection, from side effects of uh, medications, from recurrent um, kidney disease and the transplant. And we're dealing with that pretty well. Actually, um, uh, over last 10 years, 10 years ago, about 58% um, of all the transplant kidneys would fail after 10 years. 10 years, um, graft failure was 58%. Right now, it's 51%. So it's coming down. Kidneys are uh, uh, working longer. But uh, we're not doing very well with this problem. So uh, the most common cause of uh, kidney failure is still a, um, death with functioning graft, so, um, which shouldn't be. Uh, basically, it means that we're, we're, we're losing kidney years um, that we could use um, more wisely. Um, so, so this this just shows that um, death of functioning death of functioning graft, ten year is not getting better, five year is not getting better. We're not improving in that at all. Uh, so the new kidney allocation system that was implemented in 2014 is basically the bottom line. Uh, the main change was that it's trying to place the best kidneys into the best recipients. Uh, so best top 20% of kidneys are going into best top 20% uh, recipients right now. So they introduced a lot of, uh, a lot of terms right now. So there's um, one uh, term, uh, KDPI, uh, which every uh, deceased donor kidney is assigned. So KDPI is Kidney Donor Profile Index. It basically tells how long the kidney is expected to function compared to all of our kidneys. So it's top 20% of kidneys. Each recipient on the wait list for the kidney is given an EPTS score, estimated post-transplant survival score. So that basically means how long the candidate will need a functioning kidney compared to all other candidates waiting on the wait list. Um, so best 20% of uh, kidneys are now allocated first to the best 20% of recipients waiting on the uh, wait list. Uh, the other changes in the allocation system um, in 2014 were uh, the start of the wait time instead of uh, starting from the time of the listing for the transplant. Uh, now the first day goes to their first dialysis day. So in 2014, um, uh, we have been transplanting only people who were on dialysis for 10 years, 12 years. Uh, but now I think we have um, already transplanted all those people, so now we're back to normal. Um, the other thing uh, that this um, allocation system addressed is highly sensitized people. So um, some people have a very high PRA, which is panel reactive antibodies. Um, it basically means um, that they have a lot of antibodies against the most common HLA antigens in their system, and it's going to be very hard to find them a kidney that will match. So um, this new allocation system um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, has changed that. So people with, that are very highly sensitized with PRA of more than 98%, they get offers not only from the uh, organ procurement OPO region, but nationally. So they, get, they have a better chance of getting transplanted. So this, this just shows how you calculate the kidney donor profile index. So basically, <clears throat> uh, age, um, weight, high BMI, ethnicity, hypertension, diabetes, cause of death, if somebody dies of cardiovascular, of CDA, um, it, it makes the quality of the kidney worse. Um, serum creatinine, of course, hepatitis C, and death from cardiac demise um, um, will go all into the calculation of the um, KDPI. Uh, we are not using these kidneys uh, uh, very efficiently right now. Um, a lot of his kidneys um, uh, are not accepted uh, in any program. 
So as you can see, more than 50% of these kidneys, although they have been recovered, they have been refused by all the transplant programs and they're discarded. Um, uh, as compared to the kidney, uh, kidneys, in the best, like the best 20% of kidneys, most of them are, are being used. So are these kidneys really so bad? Um, it, sounds, it, sounds, it sounds bad, like if you get the 15%, like the kidney from the 15% of worst kidneys. So are they really that bad? They might not be, actually. So this, this graph shows um, graph survival, so kidney survival among disease donor kidney transplant recipients by KDPI. And just pay attention, this is not zero. This is 50%. And um, this is um, graph survival after five, about five years. So kidneys, the bad kidneys, the bad kidneys um, after five years, more than 50% of these kidneys are still working. So think about that. Um, our average age for a transplant recipient in our program is about 62 years. So we're transplanting pretty old people. We're transplanting people who are 78 years old. So maybe for that 78 year old kidney that'll last um, five years is actually pretty good. And we actually know that it will increase their uh, life expectancy too. So we should be more, um, more aggressive with transcending these kidneys. Uh, so um, talking about the KDPI, I kind of tell about this. Um, we um, are a part of big UNOS project, and we're very proud of it. Um, it's called a Coin Project, and it is a um, collaborative innovation and improvement network. Uh, basically, the goal of this project is to um, make the policies um, and uh, protocols for transplant programs to improve the use of poor quality kidneys. Um, a, a, few, a few centers have been um, selected in the United States and we are uh, part, of, part of it. So we're excited to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> so um, this project, uh, this study will hopefully uh, reduce uh, risk avoiding behaviors in the transplant program. So since we're followed by um, UNOS for our outcomes, uh, we, we, we don't want to compromise our outcomes. And um, programs tend to, to avoid high-risk kidneys that are not going to last that long and are, um, are refusing them and not using them. So, so this program will try to make policy so that programs don't refuse these kidneys trying to, to, to improve their outcomes. And while we're in this study, that's a good thing, um, so we're not going to be flagged even if we don't do that, that well since we're in this program right now. So that's a yes for us. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, the ever change in the policy in allocating kidneys. Um, so um, uh, the policy was introduced in 2014 and it tried to um, increase uh, transplantation in people who are very highly sensitized, who have a lot of antibodies against HLA antigens. Um, so um, usually uh, kidneys are placed in the within the OPO region. There are a few, a few states in each OPO region. There are to total 12 OPO regions. Um, and there, look, we don't ship kidneys from Kentucky to California uh, routinely, unless uh, there is a patient with very, who is very highly sensitized um, and there is a kidney that is a match for that patient, then the kidney would be shipped. So that increased the rates of, of people with very high sensitization, the rates of transplantation in these people. <clears throat> now, um, uh, the other problem, so I know a lot of people are interested in GI here and a lot of, I see a lot of people rounding with um, uh, liver transplant team, uh, and so this comes up a lot. Um, so this is just an example, uh, patient number two, and it's a real patient too. Um, so he's a 59-year-old Caucasian male with history of hepatitis C, cirrhosis, uh, who was admitted to the hospital in March uh, with change in lender status and ascites. And creatinine admission was 1.7, but it quickly got worse. Um, it went to four, urinalysis was bland, except for a few granular tasks. Total bilirubin was 42. He became anuric, and we started him on continuous renal replacement therapy. Uh, patient, uh, so um, uh, 
from the records, his last normal creatinine um, of less than one was uh, from about a month ago. So he does not, it doesn't seem like he has CKD. He only has acute kidney injury. He was worked up very fast for a liver transplant. In a couple of days, after a couple of days, he was placed um, on a liver transplant list. And I guess since his bilirubin was so high, his MELT score was very high, um, he got the transplant very quickly. So should we throw a kidney in? And I'm not even kidding. This is a real question that um, surgeons ask us and uh, hepatologists ask us. So should we throw a kidney in into this patient who is getting a liver transplant? Uh, <clears throat> up until recently, we've been throwing these kidneys in quite a bit. Um, it was easy for us and it was easier, like it gave the peace of mind for, um, for the liver transplant surgeons, but it was probably not the right thing to do. So um, this, is, this is a study that um, uh, showed that people um, who get liver transplant and who have kidney injury before the transplant do much better if they get combined kidney and liver transplant compared to liver transplant alone. So it was a huge database analysis, um, you know, database analysis, um, and they looked at people with renal insufficiency prior to liver transplant. Um, so renal insufficiency they defined as creatinine more than 2.5 or dialysis twice during the previous week. They had a lot of people. So liver transplant alone was um, 1,500. Combined liver and kidney was 2,700. And both graft, meaning liver survival, and patient survival was statistically better if you transplant both kidney and liver. So uh, people were transplanting liver and kidney pretty often and pretty easily. Uh, but is there a problem with this picture? Um, actually, there is. So if you transplant a kidney into a patient who is getting liver, you're removing that kidney from the pool that could be transplanted into end-stage kidney disease patients. And a lot of these people could recover their renal uh, function after the liver transplant if it was only acute kidney injury at the time of transplant. Uh, <clears throat> So now, UNOS noticed that people were throwing kidneys in quite a bit, and they said, oh, we can't do that. Um, so they came up with very strict requirements that we have to meet in order to list patients for combined liver and kidney transplant. So um, every patient has to be seen by transplant nephrologist, not a nephrologist, and they have to have either CKD for three months, that's GFR less than 60, and at the time of transplantation, their GFR has to be documented to be less than 35. Uh, or they can have acute kidney injury, but acute kidney injury has to last at least six weeks. Um, so their GFR has to be less than 25, le uh, more than six weeks, uh, or they have to be on dialysis for six weeks prior to transplant. And of course, some metabolic diseases, hyperpoluria, atypical HUS, also warrant a combined liver and kidney transplant. Uh, so um, uh, now we're transplanting less liver, combined liver kidney transplants probably. So going back to our patient number two, when he was listed for a liver transplant, this policy was not yet in effect. So it was up to us. Um, up to the nephrologist to say if he needs a liver kidney or just kidney. So we said just liver, and then you cross your fingers and you wait for them to come off dialysis. So it's a painful, um, painful time while they're on dialysis after transplant. Uh, <clears throat> so he went to OR for liver transplant October 10th, and he was on um, CRT, continuous renal replacement therapy, during the transplant. It actually worked great. Um, and then um, he transitioned to regular dialysis three days post-transplant, and he was discharged home pretty quickly. He did very well, but he was discharged home with outpatient dialysis. Um, so um, he was on dialysis for two weeks, uh, but then he came off. He started peeing. His creatinine went down. Um, his lowest creatinine after stopping dialysis was one. The most recent one I peaked at was 1.5, so pretty good. Uh, so um, it was painful two weeks, but we saved the kidney for an HRD patient who was on the list. 
now. So um, I just went over the new uh, policies for the kidney transplantation and allocation. Now I'm going to talk about the things that we do specifically in our, in our program. So we're trying as much as possible increase living donation through donor champion program. We are participating in peer donation, both internal and national, and we are accepting increased CBC infectious risk donors. So how do we increase living donation? Um, so uh, we do peer exchange donation. I'm going to talk about that later. And then we have an exciting program, which is Living Donor Champion Program. And we're um, very modern. We're in, in involving all the social media and, and, and other means in trying to find more living donors. So Facebook, Twitter, newspapers, the Arab Times, bumper stickers, OK, buying kidney, not yet. Uh, so uh, this is just an example um, of how we use social media. And the patient is OK with us using this. It has, there's no names. <laughs> I think I deleted everything. So um, this is a web page. Um, it's a find a kidney for somebody. It was not the patient who made this web uh, Facebook page himself. It actually was his donor champion, a person who is trying to find a living donor for this patient. Um, so um, he did not get a kidney through the Facebook. But actually, I have one patient who found her living donor kidney uh, through a Facebook. <clears throat> So Kidney Champion Program, basically, we find a family member or friend who can be a spokesperson for the patient on the transplant list. People feel uncomfortable asking for, like people just, most people don't like to ask for favors or for organ from somebody. So, um, uh, so we find somebody who feels more comfortable asking for them. And it's actually a pretty serious program. So uh, these... Uh, Champions, they have to go through some education. So we have total three meetings, three monthly. There are more than an hour educational meetings. Um, they get post-training knowledge assessment. They have a test, and people still want to go through that. And um, we provide them with educational materials about kidney transplantation, with business cards um, and whatever they need. We uh, show them how to, they can use social media, what's OK, what's not OK. Like we tell them not to buy the kidney for a patient, uh, so um, it's 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 fun, and um, hopefully we'll see some out, um, good outcomes from that. Uh, why do we need to go to, to all these lengths in trying to get the kidney uh, living kidney for a patient? So only about uh, a third of the kidney transplants throughout the United States is from living kidney donors. Um, so. Um, and in our program, it's even less. So 14 hours of 82, can't do the math so fast. But, uh, and it's not growing over years. Um, as opposed to disease order kidney transplants are growing a little bit. <clears throat> um, now, um, it, I thought this was an interesting slide. Uh, this shows, uh, basically, uh, where the living uh, kidneys are coming from. Um, so we think that it's uh, usually related, uh, a family member. Um, so it's still the highest number of the living donors are coming from the uh, related uh, uh, donors. Um, but it's coming down. And what's increasing a little bit is peer donation. So that's going up. And other unrelated, that's going up a little bit. So other unrelated, I think, is related a lot to social media and things like that. And uh, peer donation, it, it just started not that long ago, and we have more and more people who are highly sensitized on the list, so we have to, to, to use that more. Now, I really have to show you that. So we've done um, uh, November 1st uh, this year, we've done a three-way swap. Uh, so basically what we had is we had three uh, uh, couples, recipient donor pairs, that were incompatible. Uh, so um, we had a recipient uh, and donor. So um, this uh, donor could theoretically go into this based on blood type, but uh, they were incompatible because of HLA sensitization. Um, we have another um, couple, uh, a wife to the husband, 
uh, and they, uh, they were basically blood incompatible. You can't put a kidney into O recipient, just like blood transfusion. And the third couple um, uh, was also incompatible, not because of blood type, but because of um, sensitization uh, due to HLA um, antigens. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we have these three couples, um, and it's, it's a big process. It's a lot of work. Um, there's no computer system program that will plug all these antigens and uh, blood types in and would mix it up and throw it out. So basically, um, it's actually a bit scary. Uh, we all meet, we have a, a whiteboard, we write everything out, and we try to see what can go into what. Then um, if it looks like it could, it could work potentially, we do the actual cross-match. And it did work, and it's a, a big shout out to the surgeons who did six surgeries in one day, um, basically more surgeries than surgeons, uh, but, uh, but it went very well and patients are thankfully doing very well too. <clears throat> so other way to do this pure donation is, and swap of kidneys is not, if, if you don't have internal couples that don't match, you can enroll in the uh, Alliance for a Peered Kidney Donation. This is national and a little bit international um, uh, swap program. So um, you enter your recipient or your donor into this system uh, with their blood types of all their HLA antigens and antibodies and other programs enter uh, their couples too. And then central, um, uh, central office checks uh, what are the potential swaps. Uh, so um, that's how we're trying to increase our living donation. Um, the other thing that we do that uh, not all programs do um, is we accept uh, increased CDC infections uh, risk um, donors. That is from um, cadaveric transplants. Um, so theoretically, th these are the donors um, that are at risk of transmitting HIV, hepatitis C, or hepatitis B due to one of these reasons. So there's like a long page of reasons, but I, I just put the most common ones. So most commonly right now, especially in Kentucky, it is use of IV drugs within preceding 12 months. Uh, other reasons, some of them I think should probably be removed in, this, um, in, this, um, uh, in these days, uh, but um, there's also people who had sex in exchange for money in 12 months, a prisoner within 12 months, men having sex with men in preceding 12 months, um, and a child who is less than 18 months uh, of age and was born to a mother who has HIV, Hep B, or Hep C. Uh, <clears throat> so um, this is also a real situation, and it used to happen very often until we changed something. So uh, this is a patient um, who has been active on the list for 19 months, is blood type B, not other blood type to be if you're waiting for kidney, has high PRA, another bad um, factor, um, and has not yet received any calls for offers so far. So um, when the kidney happens, when the organ becomes available, uh, the transplant coordinator calls the patient to see if they would accept that kidney. They call the nephrologist to see if a nephrologist will accept the kidney and the surgeon. So the, um, the patient gets called at 1.30 a.m., and it's usually when it happens, and she says, so we have a potential kidney for you. It's a young donor with no diabetes, no high blood pressure. Dragon is good. Um, but this kidney is increased risk for transmitting HIV, hepatitis B, or hepatitis C. It's increased infectious risk kidney. Will you take it? <gasps> and the patient, it's like 1.30 in the morning. Oh, my God, I'm going to get HIV from this kidney. And everybody was refusing it. <laughs> everybody was refusing it. So... Um, uh, are these really such a bad kidneys, um, and what's the risk of trans uh, trans transmitting this disease? Uh, so first of all, uh, this is becoming a very, um, uh, becoming a big source of kidneys for us. Uh, we all know about IV drug uh, use epidemic. So over the years, these increased CDC infectious risk um, kidneys are um, going up. In 2015, 22% of all the kidney offers were increased risk CDC uh, infectious risk. Um, so it's, it's a lot of kidneys. Um, 
is the risk of transmitting disease really that high with these kidneys? It's actually not. So um, <clears throat> we always check the donor for potential infectious diseases. And we used to use ELISA for checking for HIV, hepatitis C, and hep, hep B. Uh, but now we're using NAT testing, which is nucleic acid testing. And it, is, it decreases the window period when it would not be detectable yet significantly. So the window period for, H for hepatitis C infection went from 40, 50 days to 3, 5 days. And the window period for HIV with ELISA used to be 22 days, and now with NAT testing, 5 to 10 days. So um, the risk of transmitting HIV or hepatitis C for 10,000 donors in IV drug users for HIV is 4.9 with NAT testing. And for hep C, it's 31. It is very low. Uh, blood product exposure is even lower. Uh, so what we do right now, we don't talk about it in the middle of the night when the organ becomes available. We talk about it uh, when we see the patients and we do evaluation for transplants. We tell if this becomes available, I suggest that you accept this kidney, because these kidneys are good usually for young people with no other comorbidities. And uh, actually, the only time when something was transmitted from a donor to the recipient in our program was from a donor, deceased donor, that was not considered increased infectious risk donor. And, that, and the recipient got hepatitis C from that donor, although it was not in this category. So people sometimes don't tell what they've done, I mean the family of the donor. So now uh, we have transplanted a kidney. Um, uh, now, how do we prolong the life of the kidney, um, get out, get out m most out of the transplant? Uh, so, <clears throat> as I said, why do the kid kidneys fail? So the most common reason is uh, uh, death with functioning graft. The other reasons are rejection, although we're doing much, much better with rejection, um, recurrent disease, hypertension, diabetes, but also um, a big part of it is actually the side effects of the immunosuppressive medicines. The mainstay of the immunosuppressive regimens is calcineurin inhibitors in renal transplantation. And calcineurin inhibitors over time cause fibrosis in the kidney. So um, we're trying to um, do uh, something that will decrease that fibrosis over time. So basically either avoid calcineurin inhibitors or at least decrease exposure to them. So these are the, the types of possible immunosuppressive medicines post-transplant. Um, so calcineurin inhibitors, still probably the best in avoiding rejection. And it's tacrolimus and cyclosporin, and um, most, mostly it's tacrolimus that is used right now. Um, side effects, nephrotoxicity, hypertension, hyperkalemia, diabetes, um, antimetabolites. Uh, which are usually combined with calcineurin inhibitor is microphenolate mofetil, uh, and old medicine has a fibrin, very rarely used. Amator inhibitors are surfacing right now, um, so everolimus and sirolimus. They do not cause fibrosis over time in the kidney. Um, their side effects are a little bit different. They can cause impaired healing, proteinuria, lymphedema, hyperlipidemia. Um, the new class of medications, um, immunosuppressive medicines, is T cell co stimulation blockers, um, which is Belatacept or Neologix. Um, it's an infusion medicine once a month that is combined with microphenolate mofetil and can be used in immunosuppression. And then steroids. Um, our program, uh, the main protocol is steroid free. So people get um, steroid during induction, but then they're not on prednisone long term unless um, they get a rejection or they were very sensitized, so for some, some specific reason. In the United States, uh, the most commonly used uh, medicines are still tacrolimus. Um, a lot of programs are still using um, prednisone long term, so more than 50 programs. Um, uh, Amator inhibitors, not so much, but they're starting to resurface. This doesn't have a data from 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, my, mycophenolate mofetil is a pretty commonly used medicine, too. 
So what do we do in our program? So the goal is to avoid rejection post-transplantation and prevent long-term decline in GFR, mainly from calcineurin inhibitors and them causing uh, fibrosis in the kidney. So our main protocol that we have been using is reduced dose tetrolimus when combination with mTOR inhibitor and steroid avoidant. So is there any evidence for that? Theoretically, if you um, keep progress or tetrolimus levels lower, maybe you get less fibrosis. So there is some evidence for that. Um, it started in 2004. Um, so we've known that for a long time that there is synergistic immunosuppressive effect if you use calcineurin inhibitor together with mTOR inhibitor. Um, uh, and it was, it was tested um, first with um, cyclosporin in, in combination uh, with mTOR inhibitor. And that's the first study. So um, basically they used either full dose cyclosporin or reduced dose cyclosporin. And efficacy failure, so basically biopsy proven rejection, graft loss, death or loss to follow up was higher in um, full dose neural arms compared to low dose. And then the main thing is that GFR at six months and uh, three years was higher in reduced dose neol. So we don't use cyclosporin anymore. We use tetrolimus right now. So <clears throat> there have been studies done with tetrolimus and reduced dose, um, uh, reduced dose tetrolimus and mTOR inhibitor. Um, so the 12-month um, study of everolimus in combination with reduced dose tetrolimus um, had a good, good result. So basically, um, reduced dose tetrolimus target levels for a program were 1.5 to 3. This is ridiculously low. This is ridiculously low. Uh, um, if you use it in combination with my Fortix, then um, the, the target levels are much higher than that. So they compared reduced dose tetrolimus to standard dose tetrolimus, and um, GFR 12 months was better in um, reduced dose tetrolimus. And biopsy proven rejections were about the same after conversion. Uh, the other uh, benefit from using mTORs uh, might be decreased incidence of viral infections. So uh, we deal with um, BK infection after transplantation. It's a polyoma virus that can affect the kidney after transplant. And we also deal with CMV infections. So there is evidence that uh, these infections um, may be redu uh, reduced if you use mTOR inhibitor. Uh, so this was a UNOS database analysis that looked um, at the use of mTOR and, and what was the um, association of use of mTOR with, um, with BK nephropathy. So it was decreased by 30% in BK nephropathy. Uh, a big meta-analysis of 28 randomized trials um, of mTOR inhibitor looked um, at 6,000 people, and um, this showed that there was a decreased risk of CMV infection um, in um, mTOR use. So um, if less prograft is better for GFR and we're not getting too many rejections, maybe we can avoid it altogether and just use mTOR inhibitor and myfortic and not get any, any fibrosis. Well, we cannot. Uh, there was a study done like that. It was actually two prospective randomized trials uh, where they stopped um, tetrolimus, a calcineurin inhibitor, uh, three months post-transplant and just kept people on myfortic or plus everolimus. Um, it was 127 patients, follow-up, um, 10,000 days. Um, there was more rejection, especially antibody-mediated rejection in people who didn't use uh, calcineurin inhibitor at all. And there was more donor-specific antibody production. So this is not yet safe. So we still use a little bit of um, calcineurin inhibitor. <clears throat> the last patient, so um, it's a 50 years old African-American male who had um, end-stage kidney disease from hypertension and received uh, standard criteria donor kidney. In 2015, um, uh, standard induction in our program was CAMPAS and maintenance program in myfortic. 
His best creatinine for transplant was 2, but over time it slowly increased to 2.8 and actually went up above 3 at some point. Um, what do we do when this happens? Biopsy. So biopsy showed mild to moderate chronic allograft nephropathy, which is a fancy word for fibrosis. Uh, there was no evidence of rejection, and he did not have any donor-specific antibody. So um, no rejection, just, uh, just fibrosis in the kidney. Uh, we, so what do we do? How do we slow, up, slow down that fibrosis? Uh, so we changed patients from, my, um, uh, from myfortic to, Everol uh, to everolimus, which is mTOR inhibitor, and PROGRAF, and the PROGRAF do uh, goal was decreased, uh, decreased to around 3. We were keeping it really low. And his creatinine actually improved to 1.9, but he developed some unacceptable side effects that we could, he couldn't tolerate. So ba basically, he um, developed mouth ulcers, lower extremity edema, and, and he said that it was unbearable. So is that it for the patient? Uh, we're going to switch him back to his regular immunosuppressive regimen, and, and basically, it's just going to progress. So we still have an option, and we, we did it. Uh, actually, my colleague suggested it. And um, so we changed patient to the latter step. Uh, I mentioned that before in the, in the slide with all the possible immunosuppressive medicines. It's a new medicine. It works different than all the other immunosuppressive medicine. It's um, a co T cell co stimulation blocker. And uh, it's an infusion medicine. Uh, people get it once a month um, in combination with my Fortic. So, no calcineurid of it at all. Uh, there was a big study in New England Journal of Medicine recently. Uh, it was a five-year follow-up study. So basically, 666 transplant patients were assigned either to um, uh, more intensive or lower intensive the latticep regimen or cyclosporin-based regimen. And everybody received my 42. Uh, induction was with bezalixumab and steroids. And they looked, primary outcomes was GFR at 84 months. And cumulative rates was graft loss and death. Um, at 36, 60, and 84 months. And that's what they found. Um, so in both the latticep groups, um, uh, death and graft loss at 30, 60, and 80 months was lower than in cyclosporin group. Um, and cumulative rejection rates were 24, uh, 17 in the latticep groups and 10 in cyclosporin. So more rejection uh, in people with the latticep, but these rejections were um, very responsive to um, steroid, um, to solimedrol treatment. <clears throat> the other um, uh, good outcome was GFR. So glomerular filtration rate at any point of time during the study uh, was better in the latticep group um, compared to um, cyclosporin. It remained um, better at five years, too. You may ask why we don't use that in all of our patients. We tried, actually. We made it a protocol um, to, to, to use the latticep from the very beginning after transplant. But we saw much more rejections. And the reason for that, maybe, the study had a lot of um, centers in Europe. Um, and the patients, Europe and Canada, the patient population was um, different than our transplant population. They were Caucasian people low risk for rejection, non-sensitized people. We have a lot of sensitized. We have a lot of retransplants. We have a lot of people um, who are African-American. So they're at much higher risk for rejection. So in our program, it doesn't work that well. So we're not doing it routinely anymore. Uh, but we did switch this patient um, to the latter step. Um, so due to his intolerable side effects, um, and no rejection on the biopsy, he was converted to the latticep. And actually, his creatinine went down to 1.9, and it stayed low for, for the longest period of time. Uh, unfortunately, I saw him a couple of weeks in the clinic, and he's complaining of swollen gland in his neck. Um, and it makes us worried about uh, PTLD, post-transplant lipoproliferative disorder. So basically, incidence of PTLD is higher if you use the latticep. So PTLD is a lymphoma. It's B-cell lymphoma, um, which is caused by EBV virus. Um, it happens in people post-transplant. Um, and it happens much more often in the latticeps 
uh, treated people than in calcium urine um, inhibitor people. So as of today, uh, patient number four, we're still awaiting his um, next module biopsy results and keeping our fingers crossed. And that is it. Um, this is actually uh, Vilnius University. It's uh, where I started, started my medical studies. Um, and actually, that's where I got married, too. Uh, it's beautiful. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>
and SRTR lags behind a little bit, so it's just two years, so you could look at two years survival. I don't think you would see like a, a dif difference yet. So there have not been reports on the survival of the patients after the impl implementation of this, this program. Yeah. We know that even people after 70, if, who are 70 or older, if they get a kidney, they do um, gain um, some years of life. Like on average with transplant people gain seven years of life, but like maybe 70 year old will gain two or three. Oh yeah, you're lagging behind actually. We have <laughs> yeah, so uh, definitely Hep C kidneys to Hep C recipients, and actually now if there is an ESRD patient who has Hep C, we might not even refer them for treatment until they get a transplant, because uh, their um, chances of getting a kidney increase uh, much much more. Um, Oh, no, 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 oh, sorry, no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know some, some uh, surgeons in our program want to start doing it, but I think we have to think about it. <laughs> Thank you.